Um, I made one record and did one tour and it was lasted about a year and it was the longest party I've ever been to. Look at this album, Steve. Reg stood in really quick actually when Bill had to leave mm -hmm. due to illness again. I mean, I thought they were tag tags and I was laying on a beach somewhere and... Before we knew it, it was number four in the British charts and we heard a copy of it and the sound was dreadful. And brand new member, Ian Gillen. Good to have you all here in the studio tonight. Born again. Fingers crossed for a remix one day. I think it would do well if it was. It has to be the worst album Black Sabbath ever did. A lot of good stuff on there. It was a shock to me when the Black Sabbath thing came along. It was a shock to my manager. I'm still very proud of the music we made, but if I look at the albums that we made i can see a formula to a certain extent the first track on an album would always be a fast rock and roll number and then it would go through i mean i was very pleased with the music it was good and i was not in any way ashamed of it but uh, i felt there was a time to add a new dimension to it or to adopt a slightly different approach without losing our identity but just naturally progressing otherwise we'd have faded away and this is why it's and nobody really wanted to do that so this is why we left And just when things looked brighter than ever for the group, fans were hit with another change. Leo left Black Sabbath to be replaced by original Deep Purple lead singer Ian Gillen. Each time the front man was lost and regained, Sabbath's legions of fans swung around in step. For many bands, changing lead singers could mean a loss of their signature and identity. In Sabbath, the lineup of Tony and Geezer with Ronnie Dio and Vinnie Apice lasted for two albums before trouble arose. The problem centered around mixing a live album. The engineer who was uh, doing the product um, was drinking a lot. And he would tell Tony and Geezer that Vinnie and I were going into the studio and turning up the drums and the vocals. We were going the next day and go, what the hell is happened to the guitar and bass? And then you know, oh, Ronnie changed all, he brought all the vocals up more. And <laughs> I couldn't understand why they would listen to an, an idiot who was drinking a bottle of Jack Daniels every day. You know, it made no sense to me. So, he came next up with Ben Ronnie from his studio. He wouldn't let him come in, you see, and that's, of course, that's when it all, that's when that, that was the final straw. It just, it just broke up. Ronnie and Vinnie left Sabbath. I mean, Ian yeah, been a, a still is. He's a great friend, and I still speak to him a lot. Um, I think he's a real good, good vocalist. It, 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 it's certainly identifiable his voice is.
I lost touch with Salva's career um, over the last few years, working with my own band, and they hadn't done so much work in Europe and the Far East where I was mainly concentrated. And um, I mean, I thought they were tax exiles laying on a beach somewhere. And I got a phone call from Tony Iommi saying, uh, "Do you fancy a drink?" Me and Tony just decided to scrap the name Sabbath and just form a, a, a band, <laughs> not Black Sabbath. So, um, and we were mismanaged by Don Arden at the time, so uh, he suggested getting Ian Gillen into the band. And Ian Gillen, what the bloody hell is that going to sound like? So we met halfway between where I lived and where he lived, and we went to the Bear in Oxford. I think we got there about lunchtime or wherever it was. And uh, of course the chat went on to five, six, seven, before you know it, we're all legless, absolutely rotten. Geezer Butler and I were under the table as far as I remember. And um, somebody got me home, and um, I got a phone call from Phil Banfield, my manager, the next day, saying, Ian, if you're going to make <clears throat> these major decisions, career decisions, he said, I think we should talk about it first. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, apparently yesterday you agreed to join Black Sabbath. I said, well, I don't remember that. The next thing we were doing, we were into uh, rehearsal writing an album so that's how it came about and that, that, how, that band really was put together on paper we'd never rehearsed it was only like it seemed a good idea at the time Phil was recovering from his alcoholism at that time he'd started trying to get himself together and he was um, he'd gone to AA and he was in detox and we called him and said come and, you know, do the drumming on this new album. And Bill said, I don't know how I'm handling it. You know, I've got to stay in detox until I'm well enough. So he said, oh, come on, you'll be all right. I had just enough energy to go to England and go to Oxford and uh, record at the Manor Studios, the album Born Again. Um, Ian w wouldn't wear leather like the other guys. So he went and got a blanket um, and cut a hole in it and put it over his head and that was his outfit. I was the worst thing a Black Sabbath ever had. It was totally, totally incompatible with any music they'd ever done. I didn't wear leathers. I wasn't of that image. You know, in many ways, some people were surprised, but uh, when you think about it, it really does make a lot of sense in that uh, you obviously share the same background as Ian. Well, that's right, yeah. I mean, we were, we were both uh, from the same stable, and um, what we're in with Purple and us with Sabbath, and we were, we were both neck and neck, really, so it's, <laughs> it's great being able to team up now. They had a big press reception when they, they got together, and Ian already looked a bit uncomfortable and unsure of himself, even before he'd actually sung with the band, so <laughs> it was a bit debatable whether he really was committed to Black Sabbath. The basic thing that I noticed as soon as I met Geezer and Tony was the, the fact that there was they still had a lot of hunger. And I think the identity, um, or the image of Sabbath hasn't changed that much, even though um, they went from Ozzy to Ronnie. I mean, it's the, the power of the band, the identity, the, the image was still there. The newly formed Sabbath, dubbed Deep Sabbath by some, settled into Richard Branson's picturesque manor house in a quaint Oxfordshire village to make the album. But of course, Black Sabbath don't do quaint. Well, there were quite a few things that happened during that time, including the night racing, um, the canal trips, the explosions, lots of explosions. We had a good um, pyrotechnics guy, Andy, who was, <laughs> I don't know how he ever got licensed, but 
um, it was pretty incredible. When we first got together, he said, of course, I won't be sleeping in the house. I went, oh, right. He said, I should be in a, you know, a, a tent outside. And we thought, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thought he was kidding, you know. And I drive up to the studio this first day, Richard Branson's house. And there's this huge marquee outside. Bloody hell, he's serious. Geezer Butler, Bill Ward and Tony decided to welcome Ian to the band with a gentle wake-up call very early one morning. We used to use all these uh, explosions on stage. So we had all this stuff with us. So we put it all round his, his, um, his tent one, one night. Buried it in the ground and put it all around. Uh, <clears throat> and we'd have obviously put too much stuff in. And bang! It went, and his tent went. Whew. And not only that, all the concussion went through the lake, and all Richard Branson's prized fish come floating to the top. And there's Ian, of course, in, <laughs> lying in his camp bed. <laughs> and we woke him up, all right. Yeah. <laughs> But of course, Ian had served his time with professional pranksters like Richie Blackmore and John McCoy and was quick to take his revenge. One or two trout found their way from the lake into Bill Ward's wardrobe um, and remained there for a week or so, which is another good reason for camping outside. Virgin tycoon Richard Branson would also occasionally turn up to check on his house guests. Ian and Richard got on very well, and I think Richard probably had a few glasses of wine with Ian, and they went out to play. <laughs> Running around the manor, throwing uh, snooker balls at the windows, and breaking them, and I'm standing there thinking, you own this place. <laughs> Hold on a minute. <laughs> The most deadly of the drunken pranks also inspired song lyrics. We bought four cars for the band at the time that we could use on, on a tour and running around, you know. And the tour manager, uh, the, the, the road manager, had bought us each a Ford Granada. Brand new cars. I, I came back from the pub one night pretty loaded. Richard Branson had built a go kart track, which was big enough to race a car on but not big enough to overtake so we decided one night we were going to do time trials. So I had my crash helmet and I decided I was going to go first. Pete Resty, Tony's roadie was there, Ian the gardener, a couple of the girls from the manor as is contained in the lyrics. <laughs> So off he goes round this track, instead of using his own car, he took Bill's car. And Bill's was the, actually the best car, he had the best car out of all of us. I did a load of laps and I was getting faster on each lap. And I must have clipped a tyre um, on the previous lap. And as I was hanging out and coming into this bend, it, my, there was no way out. And the car just flipped. It just lifted the car up and I rolled it like three or four times. And after flipping a couple of times, it was on its roof and it was spinning round and going along the track like that. He almost killed himself, actually. If he'd have gone a bit further, he'd have gone into the, the pond, which was in the middle. Are you all right? Yes, I'm fine. I was just getting out of this seatbelt, which is very difficult. Um, the window was open and somebody said, oh, thank God you're all right. And reached for a cigarette and everyone screamed, no, no, no. Because the fuel tank was ruptured and there was petrol everywhere. So had he lit the cigarette, that would have been fun too. And I left a notice on the... And there's a chalkboard for messages because we didn't see much of each other. And I said to Paul, the tour manager, Paul Clark, I said, uh, oh, the, the, the car's down on the go-kart track and the keys are in it. You know, I didn't mention the fact it was upside down and trashed. Ian wrote Trash the next day, and it's seen by many as the standout track on the album. And the next morning I went in and I heard this track that I'd never heard before, this sort of really raunchy, sort of uh, up-tempo, grinding rock thing. 
And that was it. I just wrote the words there and then and sang it that day. Inevitably, Sabbath's antics soon began to disturb neighbours in the quiet village. The, 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 um, the studio was a, a church, and so you can imagine what happened. Suddenly looking through the control room, there's a priest there, a vicar. They got a petition together and brought it round, complaining about, about the noise we were making. You know. And he said, I wondered if we could come to some arrangement. We have choir practice on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we can't pitch properly because we're hearing your very lovely music. Of course, we'll shut the door, and we won't play anything loud while you're having your choir practice. So then Ian wrote, wrote the lyrics to a song called Disturbing the Priest, you know. For which Black Sabbath got run out of town in Mexico some years later because the local clergy took it as absolute irrefutable evidence that they were, in fact, devil worshippers. And uh, I got a phone call from Al Dutton in the hotel saying, gotta go, uh, we're being escorted to the airport. Um, and I can see the crowd marching down the street. Music's there to be enjoyed, and we don't really want um, political or pseudo-religious zealots getting involved and getting aggressive over the whole thing. I think in terms of contemporary music, we've got a, a legitimate statements to make the same as everyone else. Born Again is known as Sabbath's Marmite album. You either love it or hate it. I love the album. It's, I think it's fantastic. Um, what I didn't like was the way it changed from what I was hearing on the monitors. Before we knew it, it was number four in the British charts and we heard a copy of it and it, the sound was all dreadful. You know? <laughs> Fingers crossed for a remix one day. I think it would do well if it was. album sleeve look at this magnificent album sleeve but this is an album sleeve that I didn't want to do I was doing Aussie album sleeves right and this was a political stance by Don Arden to get people that were working for Sharon into his camp so I was asked to design this sleeve and it's like what's the worst idea what's it called born again what's the worst idea it's supposed to guy not as Black Sabbath, we were thinking like a Gill and an Army bottle or something like that, and Ward or... And then, uh, right at the last minute, the record company says, we're not, you've got to put it out as a Sabbath album. And there's the contract. You contracted to do it. And I just didn't want any part of it. I mean, we had to go along with the record company. And then... 
his voice is way too subtle to go with the bludgeoning kind of chunky metal stuff that Sabbath do. It doesn't make sense. Born Again, released in September 1983, was an incredibly heavy album. But the combination of Gillan's lyrics and vocals sat uncomfortably alongside Iommi's dark and ominous riffs. Born Again has to be the worst album Black Sabbath ever did, including the cover. I mean, come on. And the songs I think were quite good. Born Again, Zero the Hero, Disturbing the Priest, uh, Digital Bitch, Trashed, you know, a lot of good stuff on there. I'll be honest with you, we were touring mm. Europe in um, 83 and we got a cassette of the album and we heard this song called Zero the Hero and the driver's side window went down, the eject button got hit and the tape went out the window and went, what is this shit? Terrible record. Disturbing the Priest and Zero the Hero are okay, quite decent, the rest of it is a mess. It sounds like Ian Gillan and Black Sabbath not getting on. They didn't quite know what they wanted to do. It was a bit unfair to bring Ian into Black Sabbath and expect him to, especially after being with such a, a name band as Purple for so many years and being sort of the main front character of Deep Purple, to bring him into Black Sabbath and expect him to sort of sing all Black Sabbath stuff to how we, we were used to it. A very difficult job and um, particularly for somebody like him, of, uh, say coming from Purple. And it, it just didn't quite work. That was the very first album ever in my life that I played clean and sober. It's totally there, totally sober. And um, and then I drank again because there was going to be a tour uh, to follow that up. And uh, I tried to get along with the idea of Ozzy not being there. Let's try this with Ian. And I started becoming in a lot of fear and I was unable to share the fears. Instead, I drank behind them. It was his six months that he's been stopped drinking, so I went out and bought him a plaque, you know, Bill Ward, uh, six months and stopped drinking, congratulations, so on. I got back to the bloody house with it, and he was drunk. And I couldn't believe it. I went, oh, no. I mean, there's no way he would have handled it, to say, for instance, this last tour we've just done of Europe, because uh, you, you can't very well go to reception parties and stuff everybody's drinking and you're you're a recovering alcoholic and everybody's drinking around you and you're standing there going oh <laughs> what do i do and i came back to america and basically lived on on streets and um until i became so ill again that i was uh that i was ready to go into a hospital and um get you know try and get well and that was, uh, I went back into the hospital in uh, January the 2nd, I believe it was, or the 3rd, 1984. And I haven't had a drink or a drug since. Uh, uh, part of the, the Born Again concept is that you now have Bev Bevan in the band, of mm -hmm. ELO fame. But he is, is he, he's not on the record. Bill Ward is on the record. Bill Ward's yeah. on the record. And he's, I mean, first of all, when he first came with us, he says, well, as long as I don't have to do any drum solos, he says, I don't like drum solos. And he says, OK, fine. And people would think of Bev as being, well, you know, it's a total change to Sabbath. But in actual fact, Bev's a very, very, very powerful drummer. Extremely powerful. Bev stood in really quick, actually, when Bill had to leave mm -hmm. due to illness again. Yeah. And um, Bev has been doing the tour with us, and it'll be... I think a member of the band now, will he? <laughs> well, his, his loan is from ELO is becoming yeah, more and more permanent, and I think uh, we'd all like him to stay. 
Uh, you guys are buddies, aren't you? Yeah. From well, I can't stand Earl Bev personally. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> well, at least on stage. You're no, he's, he's <laughs> great. He's great. Uh -huh. Fits in great. And he's also going potty now because he's got a chance to really play loud, you know. I think over the last few years he's been fairly constrained in what he's been able to do. Yeah. yeah. And like all drummers like going berserk, you know, so he's loving it. Black Sabbath is back together and back on tour, but with a brand new lineup. Tony Iommi, you were with the original group. Why don't you introduce everybody? Everybody. Okay. Ian Gillen. Good morning. Good evening. Good day. Dave <laughs> Dillon. Geezer Butler. And me, Tony Iommi. <laughs> The band made plans for the stage show to take the LP on the road. And then we went on tour, the famous tour, which um, featured Stonehenge. We had uh, a company called LSD do a stage set. We were going to do a big American tour. We were opening at the Maple Leaf Gardens. Somebody said, anyone got an idea of what we should do as a stage set? Geezer said, Stonehenge. And the bloke said, well, that's a great idea. How do you visualise it? And Geezer said, well, life size, of course. So they produced a life-size Stonehenge in uh, carbon fibre and whatever. When this thing first showed up, we go, bloody hell, is this it, you know? Where are we going to put this? We probably weren't going to be able to actually get these things up on most stages in the world. We have a couple of pictures of your stage set. We've been talking about the stage set, the Stonehenge set. Uh, maybe we could flash these up on the screen. Yeah. Well, this is the miniature set. That, um, with the little miniature dolls? No, that's, oh. that's the miniature <laughs> Stonehenge <laughs> because what happened was that, in fact, the original Stonehenge that we built was bigger than the Stonehenge in, oh. in Salisbury Plain. And it was great, but uh, when we found uh, how actually big it was, we set it all up on the first night and no one could see us. And we, we could get about a quarter of it on stage and we're sort of edging between these huge monoliths and whatever. The life-size Stonehenge was just the first in a series of Spinal Tap-esque surprises that the manager, Don Arden, had in store for the band. The next one was a little smaller, though. He said, I just want to introduce you to this chap. And we walked in the room and there's this little chap with a red rubber suit on with eyes and, and bloody hell. On the, on the, the last... Pre we noticed a dwarf walking around on the day before the opening show. And... What's this dwarf? Oh, never mind, never mind. And it was the baby off the, the Born Again album. Who appeared on top of the Stonehenge, miming to the sound of a, a baby's scream that was flanged, or phased as it used to be called. He'd get up on, and run across the, the small columns, which weren't small, they were probably 15 foot high. We stood there in wonderment as this twisted dwarf managed to rise up in the middle and fall away to this echo, echoing baby scream onto a pile of mattresses. And then jump into the front of the stage and go like this, and his eyes would light up. At which point the cue was for the roadies to come out dressed as druids, with their cowls and their chains and their long robes and their nice Reeboks underneath, which you could see. And they would then somberly walk across the stage in procession to the sound of a, a low bell tolling. At which point, we're supposed to go on and open the show. And we're saying to Don, we think this is in the worst possible taste, this dwarf, you know. And Don's going, no, the kids will love it, the kids will love it, you know, it'll be great. And of course, you can imagine how that went down with the crew, because they absolutely hated him. Because he was a star, you know, he was one, off, one of the chaps off Star Wars, and he kept like, you know. So they hated it, so they'd done everything. They'd put him in boxes and hung him in the, on the stage. And so we started off the show, and the baby in full costume now. So we're watching from the wings, and this dwarf comes out in a red costume with the yellow fingernails, wah, screaming, and I'm looking at the kids, they're going, <laughs> really, I mean, just everyone was bursting into laughter, you know, it was absolutely horrendous. So anyway, the dwarf came out and fell off, and the scream sort of tailed away, and the monks came out with their cows, dong, the bells happened. And you could still hear the screaming in the background. It wasn't the tape, it was the dwarf, because we'd taken all the mattresses away, you see. And that was the end of the dwarf. 
We were in stitches. I mean, we, it was so hard to try and go on and do the show after this. I had had great difficulty absorbing certain of Ozzy's lyrics. I couldn't understand them. And uh, so the day before we went away, I said to my wife, I said, I, I cannot soak in these words. They, there's no storyline. There's no, I can't relate to what they mean. And so I had this book, a display book with plastic pages, and I, I wrote cues. I wrote the lyrics, actually. And I had them put two wedges on the front of the stage. They weren't plugged in, but two monitor wedges to conceal the book. I practiced turning the pages with my feet in my kitchen at home before I went away. And it worked very well. Unbeknownst to Gillen, is at the beginning of the show, they're going to pump dry ice out onto the stage, which comes up to about there. Thick dry eyes and I walk out bearing in mind that Ronnie Deere was the previous singer and it's great the audience is fantastic right going berserk and whatever and I walk out and they've got the biggest amount of dry ice I've ever seen they must have had six buckets up there and the dry ice is pumping out and there's floor spots and everything else and I suddenly I'm going around giving it all that you know shaking the mic stand around and yeah and uh I suddenly went, oh shit. I suddenly realised it's my turn to actually go on and sing, and I cannot remember the first line of the first song. It's all too much for me. And I wasn't prepared for this shoulder high wall of dry ice that came out at a speed faster than I was walking. And so I did a little skip and it overtook me still. And I realise now that I'm standing shoulder high in dry ice, staring at an audience that's just witnessed what it's seen. And he had his hair down like this, he's going like this, and he goes, shh, <laughs> trying try to see the lyrics. <laughs> and so I had to fall to my knees, you know, in a sort of, in a dramatic pose, you know, and I'm going, <laughs> trying to blow the dryers away. I was, I was very close there, I was looking at that. And you suddenly get Gillen coming out, and the song starts, he obviously knows the first line, and he's got it, and he's... But at that point, the floor lights came on and blind me. <laughs> In this built into the stage, so eventually I managed to get the first line. And I stand up a moment <laughs> and sing the first line, but I don't know the second song. I'm going down again, and I I heard somebody in the front shout out, "It's Ronnie Dio!" <laughs> the tour tested the loyalties of Sabbath fans, and the inclusion of Deep Purple's "Smoke on the Water" was a bit too much for most Sabbath fans to take.
heard that a doctor said, don't sing for a year or you will permanently ruin your voice. Mm -hmm. What's happened that now you can well, that's sing a, Black Sabbath That's material. a bit distorted, actually. Once or twice before, I've had to uh, take a break. I think every singer gets problems with nodes. All it is is like blisters on your tonsils, you know, blisters on your vocal cords. And then when, the problem is when you get blisters on your blisters, then you've got to take a rest, you know. And all it, it's just a simple rescue, and it wasn't a year, it was six months. At six months was plenty, three to six months. So you're not going to bow out of this tour in the middle or anything? No, no, it's going fine. I've, I haven't got blisters on my blisters at the moment, so okay. everything's fine. The sellout tour went on for the rest of the year, but many fans, both of Sabbath and Purple, gave Ian a hard time. It's very difficult to have to front a, another major band, you know, and sing their songs. Uh, and I thought he'd done really well. We're having quite a bit of difficulty with doing some of the old stuff with Ian because uh, he had trouble with his voice again. In fact, uh, before we'd done the, the tour, he, he was told to stop singing for a while while he had some operation on his throat, which he should have done. And uh, we arranged him to go into the hospital and have the nodes removed from his throat, and he didn't go. So anyway, they seemed to get on all right while we'd done the recording. And then we went on to the tour, and uh, they started going again. He started having trouble with his throat. I mean, we got on great uh, uh, as people, you know. But um, I don't think it gelled properly like it should have done with uh, the combination as we set up. Well, we found out Ian was already arranging to get the purple back together anyway. Oh, so he is, um, he is, of course, now in deep purple with Richie Blackmore. That's they, right. They've reformed. Within a year, Gillen moved on to front the Deep Purple reunion. Well, after the Born Again disaster was over with, I just got totally disillusioned with the whole thing, and I left in, what was it, 80... Uh, sometime in 1984, after the Born Again tour, I just had enough of it. People got involved that still stirred it up a little bit, and, uh, and anyway, Geezer went off and, and done his own thing. And I don't mind.